upon us, bringing us back to Jewish independence after 2,000 years, and also approaching Yom Yerushalayim, in Tavshin in 1966 day war, to recognize the miracles, the hand of God, appreciate, because even till this day there are those that um, find it difficult to recognize because of the deficiencies that are still still exist. It's not complete, not perfect. As we discussed by these other sources, that the redemption comes in stages. Slowly, slowly, right? Kima, kima. It's not all perfect, not all complete at once. But not to recognize, not to appreciate the stages. Each, like we say in Pesach, Dayenu, for each stage, to recognize, to thank God, the gratitude for everything that he's done. And especially here, the rabbis point out that the foundation of the holiday, like they learned from Pesach, we were saved from uh, slavery to freedom. All the more so from death to life. We, was, we mentioned we had the uh, threat of destruction, the Arab nations around us, surrounding and to throw us into the sea and the hand of God upon us to uh, this victory, this, to return to <coughs> Jewish sovereignty. The Rambam writes, the reason for Hanukkah, why does he celebrate Hanukkah? The Rambam writes, Chazra Malchut Yisrael Yetel Amataim Shana, the return of Jewish sovereignty for over 200 years. All right, the second temple, the Persians and the Greeks, and then the middle of the, the middle of the uh, second temple, the return to Jewish sovereignty, which we mentioned last week, it wasn't so complete, wasn't so perfect. The Herodian kingdom, the Yanai, that wasn't so religious, to put it mildly, and yet we celebrate Hanukkah for the return of Jewish kingdom, sovereignty. And the rabbis say that this is indeed the uh, the, the Shulam Rata, one of the great poskim of recent generations. In his response to literature, Kol Mavaser, Chuvah number 21, Chaf Aleph, that now it's an obligation. He's talking about when Yom Matzmur, after the 1948, the Tashach, the obligation to say Halel and to thank God and to make this a holiday, to praise God for this uh, amazing um, gift that he has given to us. So again, we got this gift. And unfortunately, not everyone understands it, appreciates it, uses it properly. But we thank God for the gift. What he did, what he's doing for us, we see the hand of God in this process of returning us back. And we mentioned this process does not go back. Once it begins, there's no going back. The rabbis say how the third and final return, there's no exile after that. Now this third and final return, it's not a temporary thing, a momentary, and we're exalted at this maiming victory. But who says it'll last? Maybe again, it'll, God forbid, it. The third destruction. No, there's no third. The first time you come back, the rabbi said, the second time, as in the and the third time you come back, it says in the Midrash Tanhuma, Shoftim, paragraph 9. The third return, there's no going back. And maybe just to start off, before we get back to a few sources that we've talked about, how recognizing there's two sides, in other words, the human efforts, human participation, the army, even the army, you said, right, you, the the glory of the, the heroic, heroic um, battles and victories of the soldiers. On the other hand, the hand of God. And we said how oh, they're not contradictory. Oh, that's how God works, through human efforts, through the giving us that strength. We left off with the Tosfot in the Gmaran Bava Matziah, if you remember those that were here, just to run quickly how the, the shepherd, right, that was left alone, and the a minor miracle the Tosfot defines as that he would have this lion uh, took uh, some of the sheep. He said, how was he responsible? Because it might have been a minor miracle to, to put upon him. What's a minor miracle, Tosot says? The, the Ruach HaGvura, this, uh, we said, a, a spirit of might and a knowledge of warfare. That God would have infused him with this, with this spirit to get up, to know how to, to do something, to fight. Again, to find some ingenious uh, method of, again, military strategy to uh, overcome this enemy. So too, what we were witnessed that in hand, the hand of God that works through, yes, it was human beings that participated. It wasn't what we call a supernatural miracle. There's what the Rambam calls Ramban. There's the hidden miracles, revealed and revealed miracles. Revealed miracles that defies the laws of nature, the, the suspension, suspense, how do you say, the suspension, suspension to stop the laws of nature, and God intervenes, and you see this putting of the Red Sea, the clouds from heaven, whatever. But there's also, the Ramban says, the God working in nature and through nature, <coughs> the Ramban says that in the end of Parshat Bo, that that is the main thing of Emunah. The main essence of Emunah, of faith, is to see that God, of, the work of God, the hand of God, that he works through and in this world. Not a momentary 
um, intervention as if that's the, then God is working. And who's working every day when trees grow and people are born every day? All of reality. No, that's, that's Mother Nature. There's Mother Nature and there's God. God is stronger. He can intervene. He can stop her forces. But when he doesn't, in other words, the world is run by other forces, God forbid. There's a, this duality, this dualism of there's Mother Nature and there's God. No, but as you know, the famous gematria of the name of Elohim, God's name is Hateva, right? The Hateva, the word for Hebrew, uh, the nature. Nature is this God in, incognito. Is God working through this world that brings every day, like the Ram Machal writes, every day is closer to the redemption, bringing this world and orchestrating all of reality, all of history, all the ups and downs and human, and all of that comes to bring about the final goal. You also say like the, the nature is like uh, Hashem's miracles on a continu continual basis. Okay. Yeah, that's what the Ramban says, the, the, the hidden miracles. It's, it's always miracles. What we say in the prayers, right? In, uh, after Modim and after whatever, Modim, Miniflotecha, your wonders that, and your miracle that we see every day. What miracles do we see every day? But the, the world flowers, <coughs> the sun, the Right, it's all from Hashem, but we take it for granted. We're so used to it that it's, um, <coughs> it's, it's nature, so to speak. But the recognition of all, and especially here we're talking about how when God brings about this amazing um, orchestration of history, I wanted to bring you, this came about, uh, this pamphlet, I see they're selling it upstairs, of uh, Rav Yeshua Rosen, an amazing rabbi that you probably haven't heard of because Rav Yeshua Rosen, he passed away uh, over a month ago, but he was so amazing besides his talent a great Torah scholarship, his uh, humility. He refused to take any, so to speak, job of a rabbinic position, so to speak, to teach in his house. He would come and teach in other places. But it was this humility, the, the walking path of the just. Um, but anyway, they put out recently some of his um, teachings or lectures that he gave on Yom HaTzmaut. So I want to share with you, connected to what we just said. Um, <coughs> Because again, there are those that even, let's say, recognize that amazing phenomenon of our time that we witness these victories and uh, the War of Independence, the Six-Day War. But maybe people say, but look, since then, there's so many problems now and there's so many difficulties, which are true. Uh, and the government, and there's, there's, uh, it seems to be going backwards in a recession. It's all going in, in, in the wrong direction. Seems like maybe we'll lose, God forbid, what was. So maybe just some words to, um, to strengthen and to recognize how to see the hand of God when it's working. To see it not only when it's all good and easy and maybe uh, supernatural miracles, but even like every day, and even when it goes backwards, that was the problem. Moshe Rabbeinu, at the end of Parshat Shemot, when he goes to Paro and he tells him, save my, send my people, let my people go, whatever. And then uh, he goes to Paro and then what happens? Things get worse. The, he, how do you say, he, the, the slavery, he puts it more, uh, even more, more difficult. They have to get their own, make their own, uh, collect their own material to make the bricks, etc. So Moshe says to Hashem with a little complaint there, it's things, not only since you've sent, why have you sent me? Since you sent me, not only did not redeem, but things got worse. So I understand the redemption maybe takes place. It's not a immediate, but it's going backwards. It's worse. And that's how the Parsha ends of Shemot. In Ba'era, God teaches him the lesson of the four languages of the redemption, the stages. But it includes the what seems to be the recession, the going backwards. That we'll talk about. We have in the sheets some sources about that. That's included in part of the process. And um, that we discussed also at the beginning when we talked about, remember the, the juxtaposition of the Yom HaZikaro, the Memorial Day, the week before, or the Memorial of the Holocaust Day, uh, right a week before Yom HaTzmaut. And we said there's an interconnection between those two. And that's what he speaks about here also. He says that some people think that in spite of the Holocaust, we have a state. He says, no, the Holocaust itself was ironically served a certain divine purpose. Uh, not that that's the reason for the Holocaust. But out of that, he shows how um, we merited the state. He says in Europe, there were hundreds of thousands of uh, refugees after the Holocaust. And um, 
Many of them went to, uh, to Russia. See, that was uh, very problematic. The nations found that very difficult, all these refugees from uh, concentration or whatever amongst them. And there was an hour of chesed, an hour of grace, that they saw upon them the, the need to maybe give the Jews a little bit uh, a place to go. And this pushed them to, um, to decide to give them maybe uh, the state. He said at that time, at the beginning, of the beginning of the war, there was what was called the ribbentrop Molotov uh, Agreement, uh-huh. which decided to uh, Russia and Germany to just divide Poland. The Russians will get the, the east, Germans will get the west side of Poland, and Stalin, the head of uh, Russia then, he took those Jews from Poland and sent them to Siberia, which is a great problem, right? He here took control of this area and sent these Jews far off to the, to the freeze in, the, in Siberia, which at the time he himself was amongst them. He says, we are amongst those that were exiled to Siberia in the depths of Russia. And he says, at that time it looked very bad, but then Germany, going against the agreement, went into uh, in Poland, also in Russia, in the Mifza, how do you say the Mifza, the uh, Operation, Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa, and they didn't get to the Jews who were in, in Syria. In other words, the Jews that were there, he says, we were saved. The ones that were sent away, there was a problem, it's difficult. Uh, at that time, it was something negative, and that's what ultimately, ironically, was the thing that saved them. The majority of the Jews that were there in the depths of Russia were saved from the Holocaust. Later, he says how the, the white paper of the British that had made the Aliyah, the immigration, illegal to come to Israel and made it forbidden to buy land, etc. And then after the Holocaust, the, the UN told the British to give them a, to give 100,000 100, certificates. Again, what do they do with all these uh, refugees? Give 100,000 certificates of the Jews that can come to make Aliyah, to permis- you know, permission to come to the land. Rav Cook and Rav Siuda were very uh, instrumental in giving to rabbis and different people to the certificates. But Ernest Bevin, the Secretary of State, the, uh, the British Sarah Hutz, he refused to, uh, I'm not going to give 100,000 certificates. And he says here how his refusal to give those certificates caused pre- uh, pressure on the UN. And because of that refusal to give 100,000 certificates, the UN decided on the partition plan to give the Jews something at least. Now, had he given the 100,000 certificates, the world would have been satisfied. Oh, we did our job. We gave them, let 100,000 Jews in. We wouldn't have had a state. The state ironically came because his refusal, which seems again, again, says negative, what are we going to do? Not even to get 100,000 certificates. And that's what caused, enabled the catalyst to the nation said, okay, so at least give them the tiny bit of the state that they, the partition plan. Again, the, at that time, the Arabs <coughs> refused to accept even that, the partition plan, the... Uh, the little pit that they gave Israel, like most of it they divided, and all of a sudden they said, no, we'll give this to make a new country, Jordan. They give 80% of what we were supposed to get from the Balfour Declaration, and they give that to Jordan. So Israel was given this little slice, but even that, the Arabs said, no, we want everything. Um, and they the went to war. The, um, a lot of the Arabs, first of all, the leaders, a lot of the leaders told them to run away, to go away from their cities, and then let the let us take over, let the Arabs take over, and then we'll let you back, whatever. Meanwhile, the Arabs ran away from Haifa and Akko, whatever different places, uh, Lod, Ramla, etc., Tzfat, Tveria, and um, again, we had thought that if they agree, at least we'll have a state, we'll have at least the uh, Rabtuda cried when they announced that the decision. He said, "How can at Artsi Chileki we brought the verse? My land, they have uh, divided." That's the land of Israel that we've been hoping for, praying for, to come back to this little slice of Palestine. And then he decided, now, oh, you know, of Halap, he says he went to the house of Rav Kook, his room, and they realized this is from the hand of God. This is also a stage we have to accept and whatever to, uh, how do you say, the reconcile with this, even the small image, the beginning. But nevertheless, the Arabs refused that. And ended up, so we had thought that at least that the Arabs will agree and we still have that little slice, but that they didn't agree. 
So what we thought was bad ended up the, the War of Independence. We ended up getting much more than we were supposed to, so to speak, from their point of view. So all again, these negative things that looked negative at the, at the moment turned out to be the very reasons of the success, which again is what the Ramchal talks about and the way that God works sometimes in the... Like I said, he works through, through the hands of man, through the works of even negative and the different negative opinions. The, the, you know, the example from the, the tribes that sold uh, Yosef, the brothers that sold Yosef, to get rid of his dream. You think you're going to be in control, you'll be the whatever, we're going to bow down to you. Their whole intention was to, how do you say, to defy, to, to, to re remove the possibility of the fulfillment of his dreams. So they sold him down to Egypt, he came to this, and all the rest of the story, which is what they did was actually the, the vehicle that brought about the fulfillment of those dreams. So to Lavdil Haman, <coughs> he comes to destroy the Jewish people, he puts up his, he makes this tree to hang, uh, hang Mordechai, and that's the very tree, the means of his own demise. In his very hands, what he did is what God brings it about, works it about, that not only that it'll come in spite of what you did, but the very thing that you thought was going to prevent it will be the means of uh, the victory and success of the Jewish people. Like, again, um, in Paro, right? Paro wanted to, this, you know, every child would be thrown into the sea, whatever, get rid of the, there won't be this redeemer of Israel. And he ended up raising him in his own house, right? The Moshe Rabbeinu raised in the palace of the king. He's getting rid of everyone else. And under here, within his palace, within... So things that we think at the time are going the wrong direction, as we spoke about at the beginning, like the spring, the bow and arrow goes in the wrong direction, the backwards, the negative. God is working at that time to bring about a fuller, more manifestation in the positive direction. He goes on and explains how, uh, it points out how in the Six Day War that we asked for Hussein not to, uh, to attack, not to join the war. We were surrounded by everyone else, but at least this border to be quiet. We have no issues with him, but he attacked. And later, when it came to... Um, uh, the, the Yom Kippur War, he already didn't, then we were again surrounded, but this time he didn't try because he had learned from the previous experience that it wasn't worth it, he ended up losing more than he gained. So we were saved from that. Uh, he says, if you, the point being here, he says, that in a, from this myopic view, if you look at the moment only, then things look very bad. And he explains, which other also, Rav Zevin writes, what we read recently, or a few weeks ago on Shabbat, about the plagues, the, the leprosy and different things of the house and the skin and the clothes or the different, um, call it plagues, um, negaim. So it said if some sees, uh, sees this, um, something he has to go to the Kohen and tell him, but he says, Kenega near Ali, like a plague I have seen, like a lesion I have seen. So Rav has explained why he says Kenega, like one, but the wording there, Kenega uh, near Ali, it seems to me. And the Balaturim and others explain that there's other, one other place in the Torah that's written this terminology of near Ali, it seems to me, or is seen. In Yirmiyahu it says, Mirachok Hashem near Ali, from afar God is seen to me. And he points out, and I get it, like Abzevin also writes this in his uh, book, that from afar, then you see the hand of God. Close up, at the moment, at the time of the events, you don't see the hand of God, the opposite. Sometimes it looks like a negative. It looks like it's something negative. It doesn't seem to be so... It seems to be negative, going in the wrong direction. Not good. We're, we're, we should be over with. But actually, from afar, then we see that it's Hashem Niral, uh, that it's the word, hand of God to bring about a positive advance. <coughs> Rosen, that's how it brings the, the continuation, the verse there in Yirmiyahu, chapter 31. It says, so, uh, we know the famous, you know, the song, that the find favor in my eyes, the nation that was the the remnants from the, the sword. That after the Holocaust, we were literally these remnants from the sword. And there we see that Hashem, it looked like Hashem left us, God forbid and the wars and all that, that took place in the Holocaust. But afterwards we see, and the verse goes on, from afar, looking back, I can see that it was from Hashem, that He loves us, His in, in eternal love. That there we see that God didn't leave us. In spite of all and through all and with all that, God is with us 
in those very times to bring about, again, a, an advance, like you said, to bring about the state of Israel, to bring us back to the land of Israel in these difficult ways in our eyes. But in retrospect, we see how it was all for the good. And it was brought about a positive thing, which the famous, uh, the words of the Tzlach, there's a commentary, the Nore Biura, the Rav Landau, the commentary on the Gemara, uh, it's called Tzion de Nefesh Chaya, but he's known as the Rosh Tevo Tzlach, Tzadik Lamed Chet. One of the famous commentaries on the, on the learning Gemara. And on the Gemara, that says that in this world we say the two types of blessings. For good tidings, we say a tova metiv. We say, God, thank you for the good. And for bad tidings, God forbid, someone's relative passes away, whatever we say, we should I never have to say, but lo aleinu, baruch dayan emet. The Tzlach says, or the Gemara goes on and says that in this world we say both. So the good tidings are this, and the bad tidings we say the negative. In the future we only say tova metiv. In the future we're going to only say, God, thank you for the good. So the I could think the simple explanation is in the future there'll be no bad things. There'll be only good tidings and you only say the good blessing, so to speak. You're thanking him for the good. But the Tzlach says no. In the future we will say Tovah Mativ on the things that we previously said Dan Emet. The things that were in our eyes negative in the past. Now, because we have to go by what we see. The blessings are made by what we experience, how we, the emotions that we see. Even though we can say we, it's all for the good, it's all for the best, but uh, right, the Gemara says that I called David Rahman Tavak, all that God does is for the best, but we don't see it, we don't experience it. So we make the blessings in this world, we make how we feel, we experience the, the negative, the, the mourning. So we say this blessing, um, dynamite. But in the future, we will get to the awareness, understanding, and see when the curtain goes up, we'll see how it was good, how that very thing itself, not out of it, and out of that itself was a positive thing. And we'll say Tova Mitiv on, retroactively, on the things that we previously had said to um, Dainamet, in the future we'll see how they were for good. That's what he's pointing out here, things that we look about that seem to be um, difficult and challenging today. And they are. And we have to fight and work against these negative things. But to think that they can overcome, not to, to, not to deal with them, but not out of fear, not out of yeush, despair, or a dikaon, a depression, like it's it, all is going to, all is lost, all is going down the drain. It's not going down the drain, it's difficult, there's challenges, but we'll see that from them and with them and outside them, and how do you say, mitoch, from, with, from themselves, the, dealing them and overcoming, having to deal with these issues will make us stronger and bring about a bigger good that wouldn't have been achieved had we had not had this challenge, right? Being, feeding, meeting challenges, we spoke about that, challenges, cause us to be, bring out strength that we didn't know we had and, and energies, etc. to bring out a positive, there's a lot more to talk about. Uh, we mentioned last, that's the last time, the maral, that the heder kodem la the absence that precedes existence, the negative that precedes the bigger positive. That's one of the ways of the world, how God pushes out the, otherwise things stay static. People are satisfied the way things are and they stay put. When there's a negative, uh, when things are bad, they can't go on like this, you have to, then you, you come out and you do, you go to demonstrations, you, you change, you because of our weakness, we don't, we how to say, leave our, the comfort of our homes if uh, everything is going, it's, it's, it's okay, it's satisfactory. When things aren't good, that we can't go on the way it is, then comes out this energy of the good that, that we should always have to work to make things better, not just to be satisfied with zero. But when it's negative, then you have no choice. So then it pushes out, like it says in Egypt, right? The more they were pressed, the more they were... Can you be can you frot? What do you say? What it says in the Shmot. The more they oppress them, the more they multiply. The more the the this understanding of the way of the way that God works in this world, the beauty of bringing about the positive, even if you're not ready, like the contractions that push out the baby from the womb. He's satisfied. He's nice and warm and comfortable. With everything he needs. If he was up to him, he would stay there. So the contractions, the pull, the negative, so to speak, the pains, but that forces out new energy, new life. Uh, again, we don't have to wait for that. We don't pray for that. We don't want that. We're supposed to work for good, to make things better, even if it's good, to make things better, the aspiration for the absolute good, the perfection of God's name to be fulfilled and bring about the, the, the glorious, glamorous ideal that God has and awaiting, awaits mankind. But if we're lazy, sometimes there are other means that catalysts that work to push us and to recognize that, but that's ultimately, there's no going back. In other words, God has brought us to this point, like it says in the prophets, like, well, I'll bring the woman to the labor stone and not give birth. 
it doesn't just bring us here after 2,000 years uh, and then it's all over, that's it, sorry, it was um, an accident, it was messed up. God, is, this is the final redemption, He's bringing us back, I said, there's no third return. With the difficulties, with the challenges, which again are there to force us and to educate us and to bring us to, to, to participate, to bring about this bigger <coughs> fulfillment of what we are, to understand who we are. So now we have all these challenges, the government and the things and the questioning our Jewish values that were so basic and everything is now coming into question in order to force out that new understanding, the higher, the deeper clarification of who are we, what are we doing here, what is the deeper significance of our presence and possession of the land of Israel. That's what we're trying to learn that here, to study that, to facilitate that process, to not have to need the negative things that force us to understand, to learn it in a positive way, to understand the greatness and then to live it. And then you won't need all these negative things that catalysts that push you to grow. We'll grow by ourselves, understanding the significance of the world benefit, the world gift uh, by the Jewish presence in the land of Israel, what blessing it brings to the world, what the, like it says, Avram Avinu and the other fathers, right? All the nations will be blessed through you. What a source of blessing, of uplifting of man, a revolution of, of human society, of culture. What, we're, what the nation of Israel, to be a kingdom of priests and a holy, holy nation. What it means by our possession here, it's not just safe refuge, whatever, to run away from pogroms. But that we have to become aware of. But nevertheless, that's what we'll be. With all the questions, and through all the questions, and all the problems that we have now, there'll be part of this clarification that will force us to get to the deeper understanding of who we are and to live accordingly. Uh, he mentions how at the UN, the, the partition plan, it needed a two-thirds majority and the Arabs and the English were against and whatever, how the miraculous phenomenon of taking place that, the, that it succeeded to pass. The only things that Russia and uh, America, I think I mentioned that to you, no? You mentioned that last time. Yeah, the only one, the only one they, they ever agreed, agreed that agreed on Russian America it was on that the, right seven of the Jewish state. Um, and then he brings down how Rav Tzuda Cook, Rav Cook's son, said that he heard from his father that Herbert Samuel was the high commissioner, the British high commissioner in the mandate of Palestine. They, they had the control, the mandate over Palestine. He, so that he was Jewish, Herbert Samuel. <coughs> He said how he, when he was at the, in San Remo, when they came to uh, ratify the Balfour Declaration to give the Jews a state, their home in their, how do you say, their national home in the this land of Israel, he said he saw on every move the hand of the Hashkachai Leonah, the divine supreme providence that got rid of all the michsholim and machshalim, all the obstacles and all those that were people obstacles. You know how God, he saw this, Herbert Samuel, he said, he told Rav Cook how you couldn't believe what was going on there, all the miracles that took place on the way. And also with the, 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 the vote itself. The more you learn the history, you see how what he's writing here, how the hand of God, upon the, actually also in the state of Israel, to declare the state. It was a slim majority, only two, the majority of two. Ben Gurion said, there's no chance. They, they said, uh, I mentioned you right, uh, Ben Golda Meir, he called Golda Meir's cry, we have no neshi, we have no weapons, we have no ammunition, we can't, we can't declare a state. The Arabs are threatening the war. Huh? We saw what they did <coughs> in Gush Etzion, you know, the day we declared the state, what they wanted to do to all of us, to wipe out all the, the Jews in the land of Israel. We have no way to defend ourselves. And in spite of that, the vote was, again, by majority of two, to declare the state. And here we are today, after all these seeming um, impossibilities, and that we are again, we recognize this is the hand of God, again, working through human actions and human participation. We did it. There was a vote and there's army. But all this is this, again, in the warfare, a nation that wasn't learned in warfare. We didn't have a, a trained army or with weapons and ammunition. But the minor miracle that God infused us with the spirit of might and a knowledge of warfare. The next source, uh, I'll just read it to you. I'll give you the sheets maybe next time. I want to get to something else before we go on. But the Rambam, in the same context, the Rambam, in the... Um, the Rambam, in the path of the, uh, the... Excuse me. There's more, there's more here. Were more. Uh, 
in the Guide for the Perplexed, the Mor Nebuchim, the Rambam defines, delineates 11 levels of prophecy. The first level, the lowest level, before full-blown prophecy of the connection, that the, the awareness of who's, that you're connected to the source of divine, there's no question, there's no, it's not some dream, it's a clear understanding, you should read the Ramchal in Derech Hashem, to find how he explains prophecy at this level, but before that, the, low, this, the first level of prophecy, he defines this as the Holy, the Ruach HaKodesh, which is the first stage of prophecy, the first degree consists in the divine assistance which is given to a person and induces, inspires him, and encourages him to do something good and noble. In other words, to do something good, to get up and to uh, help other people. That is, this inspiration comes from above. It's you doing. You sort of have this idea, but where that dawn upon you, that comes, that's his first level of prophecy. To save people, to save a congregation, uh, <coughs> he finds himself the cause that moves and urges him to this deed. This degree of divine influence is called the spirit of Hashem, the Ruach Hashem. In the prophets, we find this a lot. In the book of Judges or others, the Ruach Hashem was upon him. He brings it down later. The Ruach Hashem was upon Yiftach. The Ruach Hashem was upon Shimshon. What is this Ruach Hashem? Shimshon was a prophet. So the Targum, the, how do you say, the... The Targum, the Aramaic Targum of uh, translation, not the modern day translation, right? The, the, of, uh, we have in the, the Tanakh, the, it calls it the Ruach Gvura. There's Ruach Hashem, they translate sometimes when it's a real prophecy, Ruach Hashem. But here, upon these judges, the Spirit of God was upon Yiftah. The Spirit of God was upon the translation there, the Targum is Ruach Gvura. That they had this. Like, again, Tosfot calls it the minor miracle. Again, the same idea, this spirit from above that pushes him to get up and do, that gives him the strength to do. Where, again, where, we'll talk about this later, where did this, this army of the Jewish people get <laughs> this ability to fight, to go against all the Arab the nations around us? Uh, there was recently that on the radio, on the, on the uh, Yom Azikaron, the day of the Holocaust, whatever, the people that left the Holocaust, left, escaped from certain places, came to Israel on these boats, whatever, and they gave them uh, whatever, uh, what they had for ammunition, sent them the Kis, Kis Fallujah, there was this thing, the battle, a tragic battle in, uh, near Kiryat Gat, it was now Kiryat Gat, we lost uh, a lot of soldiers there, but anyway, but there were people that came off the boats and just went out, they, they became soldiers, that was, this is the army of the Jewish people, we had the, the before that a little bit of training, the, the Palamach and the Agana, but uh, this wasn't some trained army and well equipped army. So where did that come from? This victory that was not expected, like with the borders that we got, and then in '67 even more so. This comes from this is this level again. What are we talking about? Recognizing the hand of God. The Rambam defines this as this level of problem, this divine infusion, not a clear vision that he tells him what the prophet what to do, what will be in the future. But the spirit of this inspiration of inducing him to do, and this is this that causes him to move and urges him to get up and go, to be able to stand against the enemy and to succeed. He says, All the judges of Israel, right, the Shoftim, possess this degree. And that's why, again, the translation there is Ruach Gvura, the spirit of courage, of strength, of getting up. I don't want to talk about um, the soldier that was killed on Friday. It's not a little emotional. And, but uh, anyway, there's special souls, people that are just this level of, of, of holiness, of divine, of, of inspiration, of doing, of giving. Of... He lived in the settlement with my son-in-law. I learned with her 17 years. And the one that, Noam Raz, that was buried yesterday. A very um, these special uh, people, what can I say? Giants. I don't, again, I want to talk about it. I get too emotional if I cry here, then you're going to... Um, but these, these people that he was also aware of, that this is the, the Spirit of God upon us, doing, fulfilling this divine mission of defending the Jewish people in the land of Israel. But this level of prophecy is not necessarily when you're aware of it. The person says, wow, God is sending me to this mission. He feels this need to get up and do from within. Secular people, the army that gets up and does, are willing to sacrifice their life, knowing where they're going. When they went into Aza, right, the army, the Rav, who wrote about it recently, Rav, or Eliyahu or others, that went to, uh, how do you say, the, right before the, going into Azza, they have the, 
כן, אפשר לציין שטח כינוס, the... Anyway, the rabbi went to encourage it, whatever. The guys were so in full of motivation, knowing where they were going. It wasn't simple. Okay, like the, like in the Torah, right? The Koah and Mashuach Milchama that goes in and says, Shema, you know what you're fighting. But um, the motivation, knowing where they were going. It's people that so to speak secular, what they know, God's significance of the divine meaning of our presence. No, without that, consciously. But the Neshama and this divine infusion of, of this level of prophecy, you see what Pele Yoetz writes about Hatzalah, how the soldiers that give their lives for Israel. Again, this is Pele Yoetz from like before we had an army, 100 years ago. Um, in the Erech, it's like an encyclopedia, the Pele Yoetz. You probably have it in English today. I don't know, everything's in English. The famous book of Jewish, I call it Musar Ethics. It's like an encyclopedia, so to speak. There's more sheets. He, uh, okay. he writes on the, what's called Hatzalah, saving. It's um, not on the sheet. It's Pelio 8. He says the, so I should read it to you if we had it here in the life. Um, the value of someone that does to save other people, to save Jews, and certainly the whole, the, protecting the, Jew, the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, he says the value is, even if they seem to be on the surface, empty vessels. In other words, people that don't have any spiritual value or not religious people, in other words. I think he says he's more than that, even if we see them as evil, evil do or whatever, but they have their greater value. Again, you have to understand the greater, this part, what they're doing here has a value more than uh, the great rabbis. Again, it's a strong state we have to see it inside. It doesn't mean they're better than or it's better to be, so to speak. Uh, it doesn't justify that the negative is negative. But the, what they do when they get up and do these positive things to recognize the, the holiness of the, the Spirit of God that is coming in them and bringing them to do these great things and the willingness to sacrifice for the land of Israel, the people of Israel, that, he said, is a great value in and of itself, and despite the negative uh, trappings that are momentarily because of their, um, what the Rambam, the rabbi, is called Tinok Shenishba, a child that was raised among the nation. The lack of education, understanding, the significance, so on conscious level, they're not learned to understand the name of God, don't believe in that, they say. But you see that the Neshama, they're there. They're willing to give, put everything on the line. With some religious people, and there's uh, bullets, whatever, they even go running, they go back to America, their first flight, whatever. They're people that say, oh, they believe in God, everything is from God, and yet they don't have that same inner connection to willingness to sacrifice and to, to dedicate for the people in the nation of Israel. And the example, actually, there's levels of prophecy that at the beginning can come even without the awareness of the source. Again, the full-blown, the highest levels are, it's clear, like the Ramchal says there, it's clear, you know this experience of, there's no doubts, there's no what, you know exactly who's talking to you, so to speak, and the clarity of the message. But these first levels, as we saw when Shmuel got his first prophecies, right, Shmuel the prophet, the great prophet, uh, he hears in the middle of the night his voice, you know, Shmuel, Shmuel, and what happens? He, he goes to uh, Eli, his teacher. Yes, you called me? In the middle of the night, what do you mean I called you? He said, I heard you call yeah, I didn't call you. What? Go back to sleep. What do you... Hey, Shmuel, Shmuel, here's the voice. And he uh, goes to Eli, yes, you called me? I'm here. What you... And later he says, I understood that now you have to realize who's... Uh, again, the initial prophecy, the initial stages... He's not even a Shmuel the prophet, ultimately. But at the beginning, he wasn't aware of the source until he got to, again, the higher levels. So here also, it's not dependent on the recognition. It's unfortunate when we don't recognize the source. Our goal is to be, make them aware of the true source, what is taking place here. The miracle what God is doing within and through these soldiers and these people in the state of Israel, and getting up and making the decision to go against the world and say, yes, that we declare the state of Israel against all odds. That is from Hashem. They're not aware of it. But that doesn't take away the fact of what it is, who's behind it. Now, they say all day, there's no God. It's not God, it's me. It doesn't take God out of the picture. They said the world is run by, without God. It doesn't change the fact that God is behind it. It's unfortunate, they're not aware. And that's what our goal, we come in, to be aware and to make them aware, to expose the true significance of what they're doing and what's behind it all. To remind Shmuel, to tell Shmuel who is talking to you and what does it mean. What does it mean to be in the land of Israel? That's why we're trying to study and learn that, to be those that can give the nation... The, not to deny, because they don't recognize it, the divine source. There is no divine source. There is a divine source. This is the redemption process, the hand of God. Ah, but it's so secular, whatever. Indeed, because we're not doing our job enough to expose and to make aware that who's behind the doing. Like I mentioned the Radak in Tilim 146. 
right? That God is the hand of God, but he brings it about through man. And our goal is to recognize the source. He is who, had, right, it says in Devarim chapter 8 that we said, we mentioned the previous sources, to remember who is it that uh, it is my strength and my hand that gives you this wealth. That's true, but you should remember who gave you the strength. It's your strength. But who gave you the strength? Not that God gave you the victory. God gave you the strength and your strength got the victory. So they're missing that part of the equation that it's God that gave them the strength. So they say it's our strength, and that's true. As we saw the Ram, the Abarbanel, we saw two weeks ago. But our goal is to make them aware of, and we'll see the significance of understanding where is that strength and what is it to be used for, and to use it properly. But the source remains. It's a divine source, and our goal and our thanking to Hashem on these days uh, is to recognize and to be those that are aware and thank God for what He's doing. And not to deny it because it's a secular army, so to speak, and whatever. Although we said the state of Israel was declared before Shabbat. They, how do you say, they brought it in earlier not to desecrate Shabbat, <coughs> etc. But uh, again, it's not complete yet. But because of that, not to recognize what God has given us and to thank Him. It says those who thank God, God gives you, uh, continues to give you more. If you refuse to recognize it, then you're agreeing, so to speak, with those who don't believe in the God that did it for us. It was all their hand. And our goal is to, again, to expose the truth. I wanted to give in the last two minutes maybe a few hints. We didn't get to last week, I don't think. Did I tell you like a few remazim, the hints for Yom Ma'ut from the Torah, or the, not from the Torah, from Torah sources? No. So quickly, um, the Vilna Gon, I told us a lot. The Vilna Gon talks about how there's what's called Adam. Right, Adam. He says that's Adam, the man, the first man, David, the king, and Mashiach. The dates, the uh, how do you say the amount of years between the two of these is twenty eight fifty four, and so too, he says, will be the date, the years between like David Melech was born in twenty eight fifty four, and so too. The Mashiach, the Messianic era, will begin in 2854. When does that come out? 2854? Uh, 5708. 5708. Does that mean anything to you? 5708? Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, thank you. Tashach. 1948. The. Um, another, um, the Vilna Gon. Well, I'll try to do it quickly. Um, the Gemara, and sorry, this maybe takes more about it. Elaboration, but the, the Gemara in Sanhedrin 38 talks about the 12 hours of man's creation. The Gemara shown how was created: the first hour, the second hour, everything that took place in the development of man. The, fle- the, the, the dirt from the land, whatever it built up. It says the fifth hour of that first day he was created. Uh, he stood on his feet, a mother aglav. The Vilna Gaon says these, the every day of creation parallels a thousand years of history. So day six, when man was created, he was created in the daytime. So in other words, starting with the day six, comes out to the year 5500, right? Every year, like the, the, after the fifth day, you know, the year 5000, that was 12 hours of nighttime, that's 500 years. And then 12 hours, this last 500 years of, from 5500 to the year 6000. Um, every hour, if you calculate, of if 12 hours is... 500 years, or 24 hours is 1,000 years. Every year, come, every hour comes out to 41.666 years. The fifth hour is when he stood on his feet. Stood on his feet in Hebrew, like, you stand on his feet, you're independent. The, 56, the, the fifth hour comes out to, if you can calculate, you can figure it out yourselves, five times 41.66 is 208. In other words, to connect together, it comes out to 5708. The same data with Tashach, 1948, in the Common Era. In other words, the Vilna Gon said already many years ago, he was born in 1720, how this Gemara of Sanhedrin also is an indication of the future process of, of Am Yisrael's development. And the fifth hour, he will stand on his feet. And the fifth hour comes out to, like, again, 5708. There's a few more, but I, mean, I want to keep you with the Mincha and eating. I want to, maybe next week I'll start with uh, another interesting about the Atbash. You've heard of the Atbash? Yom Atzma'ut? Okay, so we'll leave that for next week. Litraot, all the best.